In this lecture, I'll talk about the hardware requirements for this project. In choosing hardware components, I prioritized flexibility and simplicity. It should be possible to substitute any of the components with equivalents and still be able to complete the project without modifications in the software. I also chose components that are easy to find no matter where you are in the world. Almost everything I'll show you in this lecture is generic, meaning that you can get parts from different vendors at very low costs. The only exception is the Raspberry Pi, for which there is no 100% compatible alternative to the genuine board, but even there, there are alternatives. Of course, you'll need a Raspberry Pi. Any model will do, as long as it includes Ethernet or Wi-Fi networking, and you can install the Raspberry Pi OS on it. From a $10 Raspberry Pi 0W to the latest Raspberry Pi 4, they will all work. I have used an old Raspberry Pi 2. Having said that, you actually do not need a Raspberry Pi at all. At the very least, you need a computer on which you can install and run the Node-RED and MQTT Mosquito services. It could be your laptop or a virtual machine with Linux running on your computer, or a Banana Pi, perhaps a UP2 Square Red, an Odroid XU4, or an Imagination Creator CI20. As I said, the only real requirement is that whatever you choose, it can run the Node Red and MQTT services. If you choose to use anything other than the Raspberry Pi, you'll have to figure out how to install those services yourself, but if you are comfortable with that, go for it. The microcontroller I've chosen for this project is the ESP32, implemented on a generic development kit version 1.1. I chose the ESP32 as opposed to a regular Arduino, like the Arduino Uno, because of the integrated Wi-Fi. The one that I use is marked ESP32S V1.1 for version 1.1 and has 38 pins with a pitch between the two rows of 22.95 millimeters. And I chose it because it fits nicely on my breadboard. There's no other specific reason. I've tested the exact same sketch on a few other ESP32 dev kits that I have, such as a 40 pin and 30 pin variant including one with an integrated LiPo battery and charging circuit, and they worked perfectly. I also tested a modified version of the sketch with an Arduino Nano 33IoT, and it worked equally well. As with the Raspberry Pi, the choice of microcontroller is flexible. The only requirements is that the microcontroller you choose has Wi-Fi or Ethernet communication capability, and it has an MQTT library so that it can work as a MQTT client. As with the Raspberry Pi, if you choose to use anything other than the ESP32, you'll have to figure out how to modify the sketch to work with your choice of MCU. So I encourage you to go with the ESP32. In the photo that you see in this slide, you can see all of the hardware components that are needed in this project. Apart from the Raspberry Pi and the ESP32, there's a motor, a DHT22 sensor, a potentiometer, and a few other things that I'll describe later. Here, I want to concentrate on the motor and the potentiometer. Because I don't want to be working on the project with a terrarium jar or filled with soil and a plant in it, and a water reservoir on my workbench, I've replaced the actual soil humidity sensor with a potentiometer and the actual water pump motor with a regular Hobie DC motor. The potentiometer is simulating the analog soil humidity sensor so I can develop the software and test it without having to deal with the actual plant, soil and water. The DC motor allows me to test the motor control circuitry and the motor power supply. Once I'm confident that those individual software and hardware components work, then I can replace the potentiometer and the DC motor with the actual soil humidity sensor and the water pump. In the photos in this slide, you can see the actual water pump on the left and the soil humidity sensor on the right side. Both are very low cost, generic components that you can easily find on the web. So I suggest that you purchase at least two of each. I'm using a regular DHT22 sensor in a special package with extended wires for the power and data pins, like the ones you see in this photo. 
The special packaging makes it easy to place the sensor inside the terrarium container. Apart from this, there's nothing special about this DHD22. It can actually use a regular DHD22 and solder long flexible jumper wires to its pins so that you can place it inside your terrarium container instead of purchasing the modified version in this photo. To control the pump motor, I've chosen to use a TIP122 Darlington transistor along with a network of two resistors, one diode and one capacitor. This configuration allows me to switch the motor on and off with only a small amount of current from the ESP32. Instead of a transistor, you can choose to use a relay, which can help with better electrical separation between the motor and the microcontroller. In this course, I'll show you how to implement the transistor switch option. I wanted to implement the ability to measure the input voltages of the ESP32 and the motor. This makes it possible to power the terrarium controller from one or two batteries and to generate notifications when the batteries need to be charged or changed. The voltage sensing circuits consist of simple voltage dividers. In this course, I'll show you exactly how to define the resistor values and how to implement the necessary voltage calculations in the ESP32 sketch and the node red flow. If you don't like working with a breadboard, you can implement the hardware on a printed circuit board. I've designed a PCB that can accommodate the components you see on the breadboard along with a 38 pin ESP32 dev kit. In this course, I'll be working on the breadboard, but in the very end, I'll show you what the PCB implementation looks like. Finally, there are a few secondary components I want to mention here. You will need a breadboard, of course, like the one in the photo, or you can use a couple of mini breadboards. You also need lots of jumper wires and a power LED indicator so that you know when the circuit is powered on. For power, I used a benchtop power supply for the motor and USB power for the ESP32 dev kit. The bench power supply was convenient because it also allowed me to test my motor voltage circuit under different input voltages. And finally, a multimeter is always necessary to use in a project like this. I used mine to calibrate my voltage sensing sub-circuits and to take precision readings of their resistor values so that I can use them in the voltage calculations in the ESP32 sketch. All this, of course, is explained in the course.